I want to bring in Bob Rubin, the attorney for Travis McMichael. And I believe also with us is Travis McMichael's defense attorney, Jason Sheffield, from what I understand. Thank you both for joining us today. You know, I know I don't need to say this to you, but we're less than one week away from this trial. One of the biggest trials this nation has likely seen. Where are you mentally? How is your headspace in terms of being ready to get started on Monday? Um, hi, Ashley. Thanks for having us on. This is Bob Rubin um, responding. Um, my headspace, uh, as in every case before trial, uh, I have a, a healthy dose of adrenaline right now. And it's because I am anxious to get into the courtroom and to finally present our defense. We've been working on this case since May of 2020, and we've been working diligently. My partner, Jason Sheffield, is here with me, and we are ready to finally get going. Right. Absolutely. I can understand exactly where you are. And the thing that I always remind everyone is uh, it is it is tough. I was a trial attorney for many, many years. Preparing for trial takes not only a lot of work and a lot of time, but a lot of people and a good team. And a trial of this magnitude, the, the volumes of work that I know your team, as well as the prosecution, have had to do in this case. So let me ask you, if I could, Jason, let's start at the beginning, because well, it's not the beginning, but let's start with these initial. 1,000 juror questionnaires that were sent out. Have you all seen a, a grouping of initially 1,000 questionnaires going out being done before that volume? No, this is a very unique case, very unique circumstances, because the coverage of the case has been so widespread, both local, statewide, and nationally, but also because this case has been pushed into a narrative that many, many people understand. Many people are sensitive about this narrative, uh, and they have taken grand interest in it all the way up to our former presidents and our current president. And so it's no surprise that people are going to hear about this case. And for that reason, we have asked the court to bring in a 1,000 potential jurors, of which we think we'll get some smaller percentage who will show up. And then we will begin the very careful process of asking them questions in small groups and then one by one. And Jason, let me stay with you, if I could, for just a moment on that point. Do you think that after the initial questionnaire that gets sent out, and like you said, you then see who shows up and then you go from there for the questioning, do you expect that from this initial group of 1,000 that are contacted by mail by questionnaire that you will be able to select a fair and impartial jury of 12 jurors as well as the alternates? We absolutely believe that this is possible. We will not know exactly how these individual people feel about the issues in this case. We will be learning about the feelings and thoughts that they have that could put them in the category of somebody who really shouldn't be serving on this case. But with the importance of these summons comes the duty and the responsibility of every juror to feel comfortable being truthful about how they feel, how they feel about defense lawyers, how they feel about the police and prosecutors, how they feel about the issues in this case. And with that truth, and they'll be allowed to answer these questions without their name being put out in the public, without their face or voice being played on national television, they will maintain absolute uh, anonymity. But with those answers and questions, I do believe that we will find our jurors to be honest to be open and forthright. And from that, the lawyer should be able to find 12 jurors and a few alternates who are the right people to decide this very, very complicated issue. It is a complicated issue. And I also think as a former judge, one of the things that is so imperative for everyone to remember is that the jurors are anonymous. And so it is something that they can serve 
do their job, be responsible, but remain anonymous, which I think is a very important part, obviously, of the entire process. All right, Bob, if I could return to you, because you were honest about your adrenaline, which I completely understand. That's not unusual. I think it's typical as attorneys prepare to go into trial, much less a trial of this magnitude. And in the past, your team has spoken about this not only being an investigation by the district attorney's office and by law enforcement, but really also by the nation because of the amount of information that has been shared about this case. Do you feel that you all are ready to present the conclusion of your investigation to a jury next week? Oh, absolutely. We've, we've been ready for some time now. Um, the, the case itself is not particularly complicated. The facts are pretty much agreed upon by both sides. It's the legal interpretation of those facts that gets complicated and tricky in this case. And um, we, of course, have done our due diligence. We've spoken to all the witnesses. We've read all the documentation we need to read. We prepared our arguments and our, our um, presentations. Um, there's no question we're ready and have been. Um, we just, you know, we just want to be able to try the case in a court of law and, and not uh, as it's been for the past year and a half in, in the national discussion. Sure, sure, absolutely. And um, when you talk about that, I have to ask, how big is your defense team? I know that the two of you have an excellent reputation or skilled attorneys, but in terms of the number of people who are helping you, assisting you so that you're prepared to present the defense of Travis McMichael. And let me ask you if I could, Bob. Sure, sure, sure. And Ashley, you may be surprised by this, but it comes down to me and Jason and uh, our law clerk, and we're ready to go. It's not a big team. Um, you know, we, we've been trying cases combined for about 45 years now, and um, we don't need a big team. We, we just work hard, we work every day on these cases, and we do everything we can. We put our, our whole soul into the case, and at the end of the day, we're ready to go. Ashley, there's a misperception that this case is being funded by some kind of statewide efforts or national efforts, that there are GoFundMe initiatives, that this is being funded by, you know, improperly motivated people. Um, that could not be further from the truth. We are representing Travis McMichael because his mother has taken her savings and devoted it to trying to hire us to defend her son and two other lawyers to defend her husband and to be able to cover what could be the expenses of an investigator and perhaps some experts to deal with ballistics and the medical examiner. This is not a wealthy family. We are not uh, getting paid uh, fees. As a matter of fact, I think there's DUI cases that we've had in the past that we've received more financial support on in this case. The reason that we've taken this case is because after our initial investigation for about a week, we decided that the truth was not being told, that the country was being misinformed about the intentions of Travis and Greg McMichael. That they did not set out to murder anyone. And we took this case because we believe with our hearts that they deserve the best that they can get. And just like Bob said, that's me and him and, and our paralegal. And, you know, to your point, I just want to, I, I think I have the benefit of being a practicing attorney in Georgia for many, many years. And I can say this, in terms of reputations of all of the attorneys that are involved in this case, defense and prosecution, there's certainly no reputations out there that there's anyone doing anything Ill, uh illegal, that's not the right word, unethical, inappropriate. I mean, good reputations. You have the experience to try a case of this caliber. And that's why I'm so comfortable asking each of you this next question. And it's about the truth that you just mentioned and you believing that the truth will come out and does need to come out. Do you believe that once all these facts come out at trial and that Travis McMichael, who we know is the one who pulled the trigger, will in fact be found not guilty of murder. And if I could start with you, please, Jason. I believe that those facts 100% support that there was no malice in Travis's heart to go out and end the life of Mott Arbery. And those facts will be clear. And the jury 
should accept those facts if clear, and I believe they will, and that they will find him not guilty of only not only malice murder, but also felony murder, because both of those deal with the death of Ahmaud Arbery. The issue that will become complicated for the jury is that the jury is going to feel the loss in this case. They're going to feel the tragedy in this case, and that tragedy is felt on all sides. And what happens when the jurors feel that loss and that tragedy is they begin to wonder whether they should resolve the case in ways that are not consistent with what the facts in the law call them to do. The duty and responsibility that they have to interpret the laws correctly, we believe, would have them find Travis McMichael not guilty of all counts. But it's going to be an emotional case. It's going to be a hard decision for many. Uh, we feel the evidence is clear, and it's our job to make sure that they see it. Ashley, if I can add to what Jason just said, our big concern, I think, is not the presentation of the facts in this case, and it's not the explanation of how the law applies to the facts. What, our, what we're really concerned about is can we get a jury that can put aside all of this outside buzz and the pressure that they're going to be feeling from the community, from protesters, from um, other people who will be in Brunswick next week and over the course of the, the trial, put all of that aside and decide the case based on what occurs in the courtroom, not what occurs in their neighborhoods. And so that's, that's part of the jury selection process. That's what Jason was talking about earlier, about creating a safe space for jurors. But that is a real concern for us, is, is keeping the jury feeling safe. We think if, they, if we can do that, if we can accomplish that, then, then we, we're doing the best we can and we'll put up the facts as they are. And another question to both of you in response to those thoughts, and that is, is it, you know, I just think about in terms of the loss and the tragic nature of this, and absolutely people feel that, and the jury's going to feel that, but I think that really, truly, in all cases in which a person has died and another person's on trial for that death, the jury feels the loss and the tragedy. So in that respect, I don't know that it's that different than any case in which someone has lost their life. Is that a fair or unfair statement to make? Jason, first, please. I think it is a fair statement, but this case has other nuances in it. This case comes with the citizen's arrest law, and it comes right on the heels of that, the law of self-defense. And so those concepts, one is very unfamiliar to most jurors, the citizen's arrest law. One is very familiar. And so I think because this case comes with this additional concept of citizen's arrest, and the loss that occurs during the course of a lawful citizen's arrest. It injects into this case a new reality, a reality that many people have never really thought about for themselves. It's also a reality that many people have exercised, but it has not ended with this type of tragedy. That is going to change this case from a case that simply involves Two people engaged in a fight or an argument that results in one using self-defense to defend their life. All right. I am so appreciative, Jason and Bob, for your joining Court TV. I know you are staying with us. Do not hang up. Do not go anywhere. We simply have to squeeze in a quick break. But I look forward to continuing this conversation with the defense attorneys for Travis McMichael, knowing that this trial starts Monday of next week. Breaking news. We still have with us the attorneys for Travis McMichaels in Brunswick, Georgia, representing Travis next week, starting on Monday. Bob Rubin, Jason Sheffield, I know you all have very limited time, a lot to do. I must ask you this. Will we expect to hear from Travis McMichael in presenting a defense in this case? Bob, if I could start with you. Well, that's a great question, Ashley, and it, it's something we're going to leave for the, for the court, for the trial. Um, You'll just have to stay tuned. That's a good teaser for your show, maybe. <laughs> there, um, absolutely. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> and what about the citizen's arrest portion? You all talked about that and the citizen's arrest aspect of this case. Jason, is that primarily the defense that you anticipate putting on in this case? 
there's no secret, Ashley, that through our filings and through the discussions that we've had in court, that this is going to come down to the jury's ability to understand the citizen's arrest law, what the law says that you can do, when you can do it, and how it supports you uh, throughout the time of you being an individual citizen uh, effectuating an arrest. And so those facts and all the facts that support why Travis and Greg McMichael left their house that day, uh, why they began to question and talk with Mr. Arbery, and how it then evolved into this tragedy, all of that will play out in court. And I, I understand you all have to go. I want to give you all the last word if there's anything else you want to add. And I would welcome hearing why no request to change venue. Bob, you first. Any other last words? Yeah. Um, really, I would end with what we said back in May of 2020, which is in the case of, of this importance of, of as part of the national discussion on race, which, which we strongly encourage, um, we still have due process and rule of law, and that requires that cases like this be tried in court with evidence that's reliable and that's been vetted and admissible. And we would simply ask um, the nation, your viewers included, to withhold judgment on what happened in Cecilia Shores in February of 2020 and listen to the evidence and then decide um, if it, whatever happened was lawful or not. We believe it was. We believe the evidence supports it. We expect to present all of that evidence to the jury, and it will be, of course, streamed live and broadcast live. And so um, everybody will get a chance to, to have an opinion, but should only have that opinion after listening to all the evidence. All right. Thank you, Bob. Jason, your last thoughts, as well as any comments on no request for change of venue. Yeah, there is there is no reason at this point to believe that we cannot get a fair trial in Glenn County. That could change. That could change based on the way that people protest. That could change based on the individual answers of the jurors. That could change based on the behavior of any official or any party associated with this case. That could change, and all of a sudden we're facing a new call to look at whether or not we can still get a fair trial here. But we have faith and we have hope in our hearts that the people of Glenn County will come to the courthouse, that they will be protected, that they will not be scared away, that they will give truthful answers about their most intimate thoughts and feelings on these subjects that we ask them about, which will allow the lawyers in the court to make proper decisions. And we truly believe by the end of that process the jurors that live here in Glenn County can decide this case. If that changes, then you'll hear a flurry and a flood of motions and filings and requests. But until that happens, we know that we can get a fair trial here in Glenn County. All right. Jason Sheffield, Bob Rubin, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to speaking to you again and can't thank you enough for sharing what you've shared with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.